everyone to UNCG, to the School of Health and Human Sciences, and to the Lawler Lecture. And I'd like you to look at the back of your programs, and you'll see our lecture is named in honor of Ethel Morris Lawler, who was dean of the School of Health, Physical Education, and Recreation when she retired in 1974. She served here for 43 years. So Rebecca Adams was bragging about her 30-year pin. This is even longer. Uh, up until academic realignment when the School of Health and Human Sciences was formed, the Lawler Lecture was an annual event. And I'm happy to say we, are, we have revived it this year, and it will be continuing each year as an annual lecture to benefit faculty, staff, and students and the community in our whole school. And our Ethel Martis Lawler Lecture Committee each year will be open to topics that you might enjoy. So let me know if you have some thoughts for the future. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Abigail Stewart, who will deliver our first Lawler Lecture in our new School of Health and Human Sciences. And in June, I will no longer ever say new school again, because we'll be three years old, and we'll move uh, in past toddlerhood. I had the pleasure of meeting Abby this morning, and it was really hard to stop talking to her. She uh, is a real advocate for faculty and just a soil gal, and I think you'll discover that. She's had a packed agenda, and she has two days of meeting with lots of us on campus. Uh, we're very fortunate that she is a past colleague of Dr. Andrea Hunter, who will be introducing her. And I want to thank Andrea, who's worked very, very hard on all the details to have her here. Thank you.
there is a recent recognition she may be unaware of. Her eyebrows go up. <laughs> um, Dr. Stewart was named among the top 25 psychology professors in the state of Michigan by online uh, uh, Michigan, a website <laughs> targeting prospective undergraduate students. And she held the number one spot. Of the two cases. 
But the university was recognized as having had the nerve to take the cases to the Supreme Court and to try to defend affirmative action. So again, this counted pretty much in the category of external challenges and, and the university standing up for affirmative action. In 2006, Proposal 2 passed in Michigan, and for the first time, this constrained the use of affirmative action in hiring. That, uh, there were some exceptions made, and it, those exceptions were fairly crucial, um, and that is currently under review at the Supreme Court. So that's our history uh, at the University of Michigan. I don't know, I've been learning, but I don't know enough about your history to think about how that's relevant to your efforts today, but I'm sure they, that your history and your present context, the challenges you're facing matter. And one challenge I know matters, it matters at Michigan, it matters here, is the economy, right? The economic situation that puts pressure on higher education <coughs> and on students, faculty, parents, there we go. So those economic pressures are shared, and my most important um, response to that fact is diversity and inclusion is too important to wait for good times. We have to work on it in good times and bad times. We may have to work at it differently in good times and bad times, but it has to be worked on all the time. Okay, so what happened at Michigan? Um, the Advanced uh, National Science Foundation set up a program called Advance, all in caps, but they didn't stand for anything. Everybody's been confused about that ever since. We don't know why. But there it is. And um, they called it institutional transformation. And the goals of the program were the ones I've put up here. I know you can't see very well, so I'm saying anything that's important. So if you can't read it, don't worry about it. Um, the goals were three things. To improve the institutional climate for women faculty in STEM. To improve recruitment, retention, and promotion of tenured and tenure track women faculty in STEM. And to increase the visibility and authority of women in, the, in uh, STEM in leadership, so that they could assume leadership roles. So why this focus on faculty? That seems odd. They're old, right? <laughs> well, NSF had examined their 30 years of what they call pipeline programs, programs for K-12 kids and engaging girls in math and science, for college students, for graduate students, for postdocs, and after 30 years of pipeline programs for women and girls, things really had changed for women and girls. So we've got major shifts in this country in the percentage of women and girls in science fields interested in math and science, thinking that Barbie is good at math. All of that has really moved. But what hasn't, hadn't changed as of 2001 was the situation for women at the top. Women academics at the top. And so girls were going to college and not ever having women faculty, teach them, changing their minds about what to do, even though they were very talented. So NSF concluded that there needed to be a problem that approached this issue from the faculty level, kind of top down, not just trickle up, which the pipeline approach was, that might work faster, and that in fact would trickle down. Okay. So the idea, and they articulated this, was that the strategy every institution should use was to focus on the institution. What are you doing wrong, rather than on women? So instead of fixing women, tell them how to dress, how to behave, how to climb the corporate ladder, instead to think about why are women not succeeding in institutions that institutions are in charge of. They recommended that one consider every level, the in institution-wide, the schools and colleges, the departments and individuals, and that the focus be on everyday practices and policies. Okay, so this was something very new for the National Science Foundation to mandate. And they frankly recognized that they were asking institutions to experiment because nobody really knew how to do this. So people applied, about 80 institutions applied in the first year, and Michigan was lucky enough to be in that very first cohort of institutions funded. Uh, the, the program still exists, and I know that there is a very impressive group of people at UNCG who are thinking about applying, and I, I want to encourage them to do that. I hope, hope you will, and I'm happy to do whatever I can do to be helpful. So we got that grant. The grants were bigger in 2001 than they are now. <laughs> And the grant asked us to make major institutional change in the areas I mentioned. Recruitment, retention, 
which we took to mean the nature of faculty interactions or climate, what people experienced every day, and what the evaluation process was, and also leadership development, by which we thought, we interpreted leadership development to mean two things, to mean encouraging women to take on leadership roles, but also to educate existing leaders, who were often men, about the issues. So both sides of that needed to happen. One of our key kind of activities was to create something we call the STRIDE Committee. STRIDE stands, this one does stand for something. It stands for Strategies and Tactics for Recruiting to Improve Diversity and Excellence. But everybody calls it STRIDE. And it's been there, we've now been doing um, workshops, six workshops a year since 2003. Since 2004, those workshops have all been cross-departmental. So they're campus-wide, open to everybody. And they educate search committee members on the issues that might get in the way of open and fair recruitment practices or hiring, uh, having an uh, open and fair hiring process. Members of the STRIDE Committee, the first that you can see pictures, well, some of you can see pictures of these current members, but initially it was eight members, all in the STEM fields, five men and three women. All of them committed themselves to spend a year studying the social science literature on what produces fair practices. And they came up with a workshop they felt they could teach their colleagues about. So, uh, what I've noted here is that what we know about persuasion and what people find convincing is if information comes from credible sources, eight distinguished scientists with credible sources, if they have expertise, or it appears they do, these eight people studied the literature for a year and they're very talented people, and if the information is delivered in a context that takes people outside their normal operating procedure, like a department meeting, so our first workshops were given in department meetings where the exact same dynamics played out that always played out. That was not the right way to do this. Campus-wide, we had a very different response. So what we had done was um, create what a Susan Sturm has called organizational catalysts. Eight people who could stimulate change by what they said and did. So what did they say and do? The workshops involved three things. They offer conceptual tools, and I'm going to review these four ideas, which turned out to be really powerful in a second. They reviewed the literature. They told the stories of various experiments and what the findings were, lots of them. And then the second half of the workshop was describing solutions to the problems this literature showed. So empirically based solutions that increase fairness. OK, so the core thing is these tools. And they are schemas, understanding that we all have and share ideas about what men and women are like, what white people and African Americans and Latinos and Native Americans and people from Germany are like. We have the people from Michigan. We have schemas about all those things. Engineers and psychologists and so on. You get the point. We have these schemas. We use them. We, they are not the same as our conscious attitudes. Our conscious attitudes are that everybody's unique and that we need to get to know you before we know what you're like. But if we have a schema for what you're like if we know nothing about you. Okay, so, and we use schemas when we don't have much information. The second thing is evaluation bias, which is the expectation that some people are really good at some things and not at other things. And so we have biased judgments we tend to assume that certain kinds of people are going to be good at math, or certain kinds of people are going to be good at sports, or various things. Those biases operate in a very small percentage range because of schemas. So when decisions are made, when people have very little information, these biases affect judgments, and those judgments have consequences. So the committee created this model, which said people use schemas when they when there aren't very many examples of a particular group in the pool, say when you're on a search committee and there aren't very many women in the pool or some other group, and 
their evaluation bias happens. It's nobody's fault. It's not because of overt prejudice or discrimination. It's just a little bias towards thinking some people are more likely to be better at this than others. So they underestimate the performance of some people. And over the course of a career, that underestimate of performance happens a lot of times, right? You submit a paper, you give a talk, you uh, apply for a grant, you apply for a job. It happens over and over. And so disadvantage and advantage both accumulate over a career. And that will mean some groups will have a lowered success rate and some will have a um, higher success rate. And that will tend to confirm the biases in the first place. So what this aims at is to persuade people that if we do nothing, the system will keep going. Nothing will change. Because these biases keep operating to keep us not inclusive. So if we really want to change things, we actually have to work at it. It's not going to change except by working at it. So it isn't going to change because the pool gets bigger. It isn't going to change because the pipeline's fuller. It didn't. It's only going to change if our practices change. So they're very convincing. And people leave with a lot of ideas about how to change their practices. And over 12 years, we've seen a lot of change in the way hiring is done at Michigan. But I don't have time to tell you more about that because I have to tell you about this. So we also worked on changing the climate. And we didn't think that our changing our recruitment practices by itself would change the climate. But we were pretty sure if we brought a more diverse faculty to Ann Arbor and they encountered the same environment everybody had been complaining about, then they weren't going to stay, they weren't going to thrive, it wasn't going to be good. So we needed to really influence the climate. And by accident, we fell over the idea of using an existing theater group that trained T, uh, faculty and TAs in multicultural classroom issues, we asked them to help us with faculty issues. So they designed sketches that are facilitated with the faculty discussing really important things like recruitment meetings, uh, mentoring interactions between senior faculty and junior faculty, tenure evaluation committees, and the new one we've just developed is one on navigating department politics, figuring out how to cope with going on on the ground. In those sketches, the people who wrote them drew on the literature on tokens, what we know about how tokens are perceived, what pressures are on them, people who are representatives of a group, how they get treated, and how that treatment changes their behavior. We also draw on the literature on leadership and the power of framing of the issues, what the chair says and does matters what the gender and rank dynamics are in a discussion, who listens, who interrupts, I'm betting you know, <laughs> who has power and influence, and the implications of those kind of dynamics for outcomes. They don't, it's not just like chance, it just happens, but it has consequences for who gets chosen, how the uh, tenure review goes, and so forth. And we emphasize who can change the dynamics and how. So we try to encourage faculty to step in and do things differently by having them actually step into sketches and try something that they've always wanted to do in a department discussion and see what happens. So those have turned out to be, first of all, faculty love them, they love doing them, and secondly, they have changed the way some of these discussions go. Another thing we knew we needed to do was really strengthen our mentoring on campus. It had previously been a very informal, not structured, not organized. Mentors were not taught how to mentor. Uh, many, many faculty said to me, suppose I met with my mentee, what would we talk about? So that told me, we're starting at the very beginning of a process. We need to help people understand what it's about, what needs to happen. We created a handbook that both mentors and mentees could use with sort of ideas of what they should talk about. We use the mentoring sketch, as I mentioned. Every department is now required to have a, a formal mentoring plan. It's not prescribed what's in that plan, but they have to have a plan. And we encourage them to consider the kinds of things listed here, like zone mentors, those are people who you really don't think can do much mentoring one-on-one -on -one with people. They're, they don't do that well, but who could give a, a seminar on how to get a grant from NIH. They're great at that, 
and they're happy to share their knowledge. So figuring out productive mentoring roles for people who maybe aren't so good at the one-on-one -on -one, and relieving the pressure on the people who are good at the one-on-one -on -one, that they don't have to cover everything. One of the things that really is powerful is one of our deans was very effective at figuring out how to use the tenure sketch. He required every member of a tenure committee to come to dinner with him. So there were about 100 of them to two different dinners. It was the biggest college. And they would come to dinner. He would talk about the importance of a fair evaluation and the role of schemas, how it might derail fair reviews. And then there was a theater sketch after dinner facilitated discussion, and he could close the evening with pointing out some particular things that had really emerged. These were unforgettable. The faculty, first of all, were pleased to be asked. They were at tables of people not in their department, and it was fun. And they learned something. So we now have a brochure with specific guidelines to what makes a review fair, um, things like having explicit criteria that are actually discussed at the beginning of the conversation about a particular candidate, avoidance of something that's been documented called shifting standards, using different standards for different people. When I talk about this person, I'm going to talk about their grant getting, and this person, I'm going to talk about their teaching. Doing that is not good. You need to review the criteria for everybody in the same way. Recognizing when schemas are coming into the conversation, when people are bringing them up and paying attention to the process. These are just a few of them. There are others. A completely different thing we did, and this I always recommend is the lowest cost thing you can do. <laughs> we put together a network that's just more social and networking than anything else. It's been very productive for a very isolated community of people, or a group of people who are not a community. They've also found that being a woman scientist is not just a pejorative experience, which is how they often experience it in their field. It's something positive. It defines them a group of support and smart other women that they can collaborate with. Um, so it's become a community uh, after the fact. And that kind of structure needs to persist. So it's really good to create structures that are not too hard to maintain, like this one. So a couple dinners a year, that can be done. Um, if you create something much more complicated, it's not so uh, feasible to sustain it. Uh, we use the network also to surface particular issues that are bothering people. So when the funding lines became so difficult for people to get grants, it was possible for the women scientists to discuss with the provost or the vice president for research how to handle this <coughs> new and very unpleasant funding climate. Having their voices heard with leadership meant a lot to them. And having that opportunity as a group to hear each other raise issues has really been valuable. So they now feel like a group, and they're operating to advocate for themselves in a very new way. I think I'm going to skip this one. Um, one. One activity that's really been valuable, that same dean with the tenure sketches, he asked me to create opportunities for him to get input from different <coughs> communities. So we held lunches where women scientists were one lunch. Faculty of color was another lunch. One year we did international faculty. We did associate professors to just try to give him an opportunity to have people talk to him about what the is, particular issues were that they thought he ought to know about. Um, three groups, the women scientists, the faculty of color, and the women full professors, he meets with every year. And those have become enduring environments for raising concerns, including concerns about students, which this year was the biggest issue that came up across all three, the climate for students. Um, so that kind of creating some vehicles like that has made a difference to the climate. I mentioned that we try to engage leadership in all of our activities. This is very important. If chairs and deans really believe in our programs, they send faculty to them, they talk about them, they encourage their participation, they value it and reward it, and they figure out ways to integrate it into their own processes. So I mentioned Two of the deans require participation in stride workshops for all search committee members. Now two more colleges have told us they want to do that. So that kind of integration into the everyday fabric of the institution is really what we're after. Because that's what really makes, I think, this kind of sustainable change we're looking for. 
still in this early period, one of the most important things we did, and I think something like this is going on here right now, although I could have it a little uh, misunderstood. The Presidential Committee on Gender and Science and Engineering charged three subcommittees, which were chaired by the three <coughs> deans of the biggest colleges, to review all uh, policies campus-wide that applied to the issues of faculty tracks. We have research tenure and clinical tracks. Uh, and work family integration issues. Another one looked at recruitment, retention, and leadership, and a third looked at evaluation and promotion of faculty. Those three subcommittees each made recommendations about how things would have to change if you were going to make them fair and helpful and supportive to women in STEM. <coughs> they made a list of 48 recommendations across the three, and the larger committees spent the next eight years implementing them one at a time. So as of 2012, we have now implemented all the recommendations that were made, with the exception of about three that turned out to be either illegal or politically impossible. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we really um, feel like we made a major accomplishment. I do also think they all need to be reviewed again now. It's 10 years later and the world changes. But here are some examples of things that happened. We have annual monitoring of data by the leaders, so our demographic indicators about diversity are reviewed in an official meeting, and there's a posted document <coughs> on the ADVANCE website. There's also a steering committee of deans that take it to um, chairs um, that review the data and discuss the implications of the data for, uh, for practices. There are these recruitment-related policies we distribute information about faculty search candidate pools and national pools by gender and race. We have something called shortlist reviews. If you want to bring people to campus and from a department for, uh, as candidates for positions, you have to tell the dean how many applications did you get? Did they reflect the PhD rates? for five years ago in your field by gender and race. If they didn't, and if your shortlist is not diverse, he or she may not let you bring candidates to a campus at all, or may ask you to come back with a different shortlist. That has changed. Who are on the shortlists? And who are on the shortlist, that is who comes to campus, of course, constrains who you can hire. So if your shortlist isn't diverse, you're not going to hire diversely. That's made a big difference, shortlist review. This is a common practice in advanced institutional transformation institutions because California implemented it and everybody else just went and copied it. That's what we do. We copy good practices and we um, tell each other about the stuff that fails. We also created a candidate evaluation tool that search committees could use to maximize good practices. We now have a version of it for reviewing the pile of folders and another version of it for, I guess I'm talking in the pre-digital age, but you know what I mean, <laughs> for reviewing the big list, and another version for reviewing the short list. And we support analysis of that material if, if a department feels that they can't handle it themselves. There are many family-friendly policies that were altered as a result of the review I mentioned, including increased daycare slots, increased infancy slots, longer hours, and so forth. But the ones I noted here is a more generous leave policy for both men and women uh, with any kind of uh, family responsibilities that make it necessary for them to stop out, and a dual career program with a significant budget to support incentivizing hiring uh, partners of people we're trying to recruit. And finally, and the thing that turned out to be the most contentious was a more flexible tenure clock. So we've made that clock more flexible for both family and professional reasons. If things happen, then your lab doesn't get set up for 18 months. Time off the clock is perfectly uh, legitimate. And we have tried to change the discourse on campus so that instead of talking about extra time when people are taking care of people, we talk about it as compensation for time lost. Uh, and that's really mandated by, again, that same wonderful dean, and it percolated across the whole university. Okay, that was stage one. We set those things in motion. In stage two, NSF funding ended. <laughs> and NSF said, well, so long, institutionalized what worked. Um, you know, we're glad you were here. 
keep coming to our meetings, but we won't pay for it. And um, Michigan had a, a very hard decision to make, as every institution does at the end of these grants, of would it just stop the program as a programmatic initiative, internalize what it could, and you know forget about the stride committee, all the things that I've described that take extra time and, and compensation. The decision was made to internalize the program and to uh, make it, sorry, on a five-year uh, decision cycle like most programs in Michigan. So it would be subject to external review, so we had a full review and then it was renewed for five years and that's the process we live under today, which I think is a perfectly reasonable process. I report to the provost's office. I, when it was a grant, I was just a PI on a grant. So I got the provost's attention when I could. But the provost had a choice about that. Well, the provost always has a choice. But having a reporting line to the provost certainly clarified that this is who was my boss, but also that that person needed to be aware of what we were up to. The deal was, and this was sought by them, that we would expand the program to all fields, not just STEM. And I was extremely willing to do that because I was aware, after five years of this process, that the STEM field, field members, that STEM faculty, really felt stigmatized by being held out as having a problem. And being stigmatized is not a state of being that is conducive to good things. <laughs> So really, recognizing that everybody's got issues about diversity was much better. So we did, we did agree to that, although of course it meant we were serving a much larger community. The second thing, and this is what I sought, was that instead of focusing on women exclusively, we would focus on all underrepresented groups and talk about the ways in which the issues are the same and the issues are different, rather than pulling out this one issue. Uh, again, I felt that it was divisive to focus on only one issue, and in addition, I felt it was kind of stupid. It <laughs> prevented us from being able to think about how is this the same and different for men of color or women of color or white men. How do we need to think about people with disabilities or people who are gay and lesbian and who are coming to Michigan, which have very um, undesirable features as a, as a state for uh, the rights of gay and lesbian individuals. So that all changed in 2007. All of it was on the table and we were able to talk about it. So the mission was then to develop new programs. We had to alter every program to be more inclusive ourselves of all of these issues. So we did. But a couple new things happened. We were asked to do climate reviews. Every five years, departments are reviewed at Michigan where small schools are reviewed. and that process of external review did not have a climate, a formal climate component. So we were asked, could you measure the climate in these units so that it could feed into the review process? If we've got issues around these matters, they could surface and we could get external advice and we could also make our own advice. So that's become part of the process. We review the climate for faculty, staff, and students every, for every unit on campus. And now that we've been doing that for a while, we've got a huge database and it allows us to say, your unit, though this number might look low to you, it's actually high compared to other units like you. So we're in a position to give units comparative data that they're very much valued. Um, so that's another case of us ending up part of the routine practices of the institution. During this period, we created a new program with the support from NSF, smaller support. This is a program where we teach small teams of faculty, two to four, four faculty, who come with a change project. They want to improve the mentoring of graduate students. They want to change admission of graduate students. They want to change the way they review faculty annually and in their third year review and in the tenure review in the department. So they come into the program, the program lasts for one full day and two half days, and then they are provided with minimal support over a whole year. But it, during those uh, two days, they develop a year-long plan for how they're going to make this change. There are a couple of important features of this. The first is faculty assume that if they have the smartest argument, they'll win and they'll change it, which is, of course, not true. Uh, 
who's got the smartest argument is always debatable, but secondly, even if they did, they might not win just because people aren't really <coughs> concerned about smart arguments. They're concerned about not having things change. So they learn that the issue is needs to be thought about differently. What are the resources for making this change, and what are the barriers to it? And if you think about it that way, very different, not about your arguments, very different kind of plan, then you can figure out how to mobilize the resources and how to neutralize the barriers. The uh, faculty groups that have gone through this program, we did it nationally with NSF funding, um, and then after three years of NSF funding, we've just internalized it as our own program. Uh, the faculty who participated have really valued the opportunity to learn how to make change. Faculty don't know how to make change. And how to use each other as allies in making that change. Chairs have learned to use this program. They, go, they have an agenda. They bring a few faculty with them to this program and they figure out how to make it happen. So we've had a very high success rate with the projects that people have come to the program with. And success at making change breeds more success. People think, okay, I did that, maybe I can do this. So maybe it is possible to make changes. We were re-reviewed, and the institution recommitted to us in 2011. Um, and at that point, we added two, two more new programs, um, but we also just had to keep everything else going. So the two new programs I want to mention because, again, you pick and choose what seems most urgent for you. We decided that people making the transition to associate professor and the transition to full professor often feel kind of deflated after they're promoted. They have a kind of lull, a period when they're not sure what they're up to, and that that might be a good moment to capture them and kind of have them, first of all, be provided with some support so they get a one-hour conversation with a professional coach who talks to them about what their goals for the future are and what they've enjoyed and, you know, all that. And they come to a one-day program where we teach them some things they might need to know. The new associate professors have never evaluated anybody for tenure before. They've never mentored a junior faculty member. So we try to give them some skill learning on those things. The new fulls generally are more interested in, should I go for president of my national association or do I want to be chair? Which, what's my path now? And so that helping them think that through, what do I really like to do and what am I good at? And then what skills are missing? So when they identify skills that are missing, we offer a series of core competency seminars. Things you need to know to do whatever it is you want to do. And those are then optional, but they're offered to the whole faculty. So we literally just decided to teach how to run a meeting because we have heard for so many times that people don't know how to run a meeting. They had gone to a million badly run meetings. <laughs> they had certainly not learned how to run a meeting from going to them. And so they didn't know. So we're going to offer that for the first time. But we have lots of other things we do offer. Things about how to con convey authority <coughs> with your voice and your stance and all kinds of stuff. Um, they're very much uh, appreciated. They're usually an hour and a half or two hours. Faculty really don't want to put more time than that into the learning skills. Okay, and then the second thing is the launch committees. And this is one of my favorite babies. We stole this from Case Western. Their advanced grant developed launch committees. I'm not sure they're still doing it, but we are. When a faculty member in a STEM field signs on the dotted line, we contact them and let them know we're going to create a launch committee. That committee is going to have on it the chair of the department, a senior faculty in the department who does work that's similar, a senior faculty member from outside the department in a related field, an advanced faculty member who will convene the meetings, and that new person. So five people. And those people will meet just for an hour once a month. That's all. And the idea is that in that meeting, they will discuss the things that it takes to launch somebody in a new career. So things like, is their lab space up and running? If it isn't, why isn't it? What needs to be done? Uh, equipment and computing resources they need that aren't working or haven't arrived, they don't know how to order it, something's not working in the system, that happens. How to get funding for what they need. Lab personnel, how to, how to work with lab techs and 
graduate students and postdocs, none of which they may know because they've come here from graduate school or from a postdoc. So they get a year of this kind of support and attention. The chairs get structured reminders, things they need to take care of, which, by the way, at the end of our first pilot year, all of the chairs thanked us for that and said, I knew I needed to be taking care of these things, but it gets too low on the list, and I just don't get to it until these meetings. And then I remember, oh, I got to do that. So it wasn't presented, it was appreciated. Uh, and at the end of the year, we have a big party where we launch them. So we only do this in STEM. We couldn't possibly populate all the committees in every field, but in STEM is where the lab issues are serious, and if people's labs are not functioning, at the end of their first year, really, they're cooked. So we try to make sure that doesn't happen. We heard too many horror stories from the past. Okay, I'm going to end with a couple of studies about whether all of this had any good, did any good. So we assessed the climate for scientists and engineers at Michigan in three times, at baseline before we started in 2006 and in 2012. And we looked at both gender and race. We thought about both the larger institutional climate, actions like salary discrimination, disparaging remarks, sexual harassment that might happen anywhere, departmental climate, overall just kind of positivity of the climate and the climate for diversity, and then just career satisfaction. How happy are you? How much are you looking for another job? And how much pleasure do you derive from all the different parts of, of a faculty member's life? Uh, I want to tell you the bad news. Yeah, it's here. Uh, the bad news is in 2006, there were very few changes. So after five years of, I hope I've persuaded you, I was busy. <laughs> Lots of people were busy. And nothing much happened. Okay, the one thing that changed was sexual harassment. That went down. That's the only thing. So if you look at these four groups, white men, men of color, white women, and women of color, by 2012, we had many, many changes. And all four groups, including white men, they all moved in the positive direction. So for institutional climate, for department climate, for faculty satisfaction and attention to stay. So um, that you know really was astonishing good news. After 2006, we were very braced. And the challenge that remains is that there's still no change in the relative pattern of scores. So whites are happier than people of color, men are happier than women. So that hasn't changed, but everybody's moved up. And you know, that's a good thing. And it proved a point we've been saying, but not really had data to prove, that if we improve the climate for if we improve the climate, it will be improved for everybody, including white men. This is not a zero-sum situation. So to make it better for women and minorities is also to make it better for white men. And that was clearly demonstrated in our data. Okay, last study I want to talk about is the, a departmental change study that we also had the benefit of 12 years of data of time to look at. We took 20 STEM departments that had been our focus for all this period, and we interviewed the goal was to interview three faculty in each department, and we did that in all but one very small department. So we interviewed 59 faculty, all senior, all had been there the entire time. And eventually, we did, after we did the analysis I'm about to tell you about, we divided them into three groups. The group that had changed quite substantially during that 12 years in terms of the proportion of women. The group that had changed moderately, and the group that really hadn't changed at all. Those were about equal size, so there were six or seven in each group. They were demographically the same at the outset. So some were big, some were small. Some had a few women, some had no women. So each of the three groups were the same in terms of that distribution, okay? And we asked, we looked at the themes that differentiated these three groups. So the substantial, and let me just tell you the reason I did this study. A provost, I've, I've worked under seven in the 12 years. Yeah. So one of them said to me, you've been at this a long time. What makes a difference? My, he said, my department hasn't changed at all, which he was right about. It's not better. It drives me crazy. Why isn't it better? 
So I thought, oh, that's a good question. I don't know that we know the answer. So we did this study. He's gone, <laughs> but we did this study. So the substantial change group said these things. We have a serious problem, and we talked about it. We recognized that we had a serious problem. There were very troubling tenure cases, people we didn't mentor, people that uh, we didn't treat right, sexual harassment cases. Bad stuff happened. We did it. We need to fix ourselves. Open recognition of serious problems that they were embarrassed and ashamed of. This is the substantial change group. Any psychologist worth her salt <laughs> would have known People change who want to change. <laughs> but I didn't predict this. I really didn't. I was surprised. At interview after interview said this. Secondly, there was strong leadership on diversity by the department <coughs> chair. That's pretty well documented. That was less of a surprise. Favorable features of the department context were things like a generation that really blocked change retired. Or <laughs> A senior woman came in with no baggage. Everybody admired and respected her, and she had good ideas that we listened to. So, lucky things, but favorable features of the departmental context. And last, a high level of proactivity in pursuing diversity. They sort of got it that you could do a lot of things. You could pursue recruitment. You could pursue diversity in a proactive way. You could go contact the students of color that you trained and ask them to help you recruit. That became a strategy people use. So they were much more proactive also in using university policies that helped with diversity hiring. In contrast, the faculty from the Little or No Change departments, and I want to emphasize here, men and women faculty, equal numbers were interviewed, they all said these things. So it was the type of department they were from, not their gender. They would say, well, there just aren't any. Or there are only a handful out there, and the, the big schools pick them off, the Ivies take them, we can never compete. OK, so they had a million self-excusing explanations that were out there. This, I know you've never heard of any of these. The second thing they said was, well, this department can't really recruit that way because we're in Michigan, or we're in a small town, or we, the coast can do this, but we can't. One of my favorite stories is when Lee Bollinger went from being president at Michigan to president at Columbia. He said the rate at which people said we can't because of location was the same <laughs> in New York City and Ann Arbor. So that's pretty amazing. So these are excuses, right? Uh, but they are, they make a nice narrative. And then the last thing was, every one of them said things like, everybody in our department thinks diversity is important, but of course it's not as important as excellence. Okay, so they believed that this was somehow a priority that was pitted against other priorities that mattered more. And those other priorities were somehow at odds with diversity, which of course is a fundamental tenet of our work that that's wrong, that in fact excellence requires diversity. It's a precondition for excellence. So this self-excusing narrative that precludes change, it's very pessimistic, right? There's no way we can ever do this. And it's very different from the sense one got from the substantial change group, which had a kind of optimistic view that change was and you can see they're both creating exactly what they're, they're creating a narrative that fits what they're doing, they're doing what fits their narrative. We don't know what causes what, but it sure was powerful to see how, how different these accounts were. The moderate change group really did pick some of these from each side, but they never ever did the open recognition of serious problems coupled with shame about past. So, they tended to be groups that thought they were pretty great as they were. They really didn't want me to rock the boat much. And so they really felt moderate, right? We don't have to do much, so we won't change much. And they didn't. OK, so I'm just going to close. From the research, I think we learned about the critical importance of facing the past and current problems openly. Open discussion came up all the time of, of our limitations and what we've screwed up in the past. 
Leadership is really important. That comes out everywhere. Optimism, I just mentioned, and commitment and effort over time. It just takes a long time. Quite a few of the substantial change departments pointed to a department chair two department chairs ago who worked on this and didn't make much headway, but now we're able to. So really, we need to take the long view. We need to recognize that those changes, those seeds are there. They're, they're growing. They're, they're being protected. And they will flower when the time is right, when there are better conditions. From the practice, from all the things we've been doing, I want to stress that change is slow. And the important thing about that is not to be satisfied with slow change. That's not what I mean. But that it's really important to keep sustained effort going for a long time. Uh, the dean that I worked so closely with and who did stay for the whole 12 years used to say, if you don't keep your foot on the pedal, you're sliding downhill. And I think that's right. That's how we have to think about this. It can't ever get to a place and say, OK, we're there now. We're never there. We're having to keep pushing forward. Uh, secondly, we need lots of different things going on to address different issues. And leadership has to happen at every level. We had a woman scientist president this whole period with all those provosts turning over. She was there. That was very helpful. She was very supportive. Advance was there doing what we could do. The, I mentioned that dean, and there were others who were very supportive. That dean appointed stride committee members to become department chairs. That made a big difference. Suddenly, we had people who knew a lot, were committed, and knew how to make change. Boy, they made it. So that was really smart, figuring out who to appoint makes a big difference. And then there are individual faculty, many of whom are willing to put time and effort in if they believe there's something to put it into and that it will be sustained going forward. Okay, this is just, you know, maybe this is bragging. <laughs> so the first couple of years of uh, pre-advanced, pre-stride, we were hiring about 13% women in STEM. We've sustained 31% hires of our women in STEM fields over 10 years after. 10 years of that rate of hiring women, we're changing those departments. The demography, it's slow in universities. It just is. We have very long jobs. But we're getting there. We had only one woman in a leadership or STEM woman in a leadership role in a, in, as a chair or a dean. We now have 16. That's good. I mentioned the climate already. I've mentioned the improved practices that have been institutionalized establishing the family-friendly policies. And I just want to kind of end by stressing that the routine monitoring of data has mattered hugely. Having people look at the data and say, wow, that's a problem over here that we haven't been doing anything about has allowed administrators and faculty to put our energy where it's needed instead of where we might put it because it seems like a good idea. Um, but to do things based on what the data tell us are really the issues. That's mattered perhaps the most of anything we've done. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is when things get better, it improves the chances that more things can change. So it is self-reinforcing the other way also, just as systems stay the same if they stay the same. If you get change moving, it moves faster. So I just want to encourage you. I'm looking forward to learning from you tomorrow and years in the future. And um, I just want to say it's worth it. And we'll take a while. Thank you. presupposes the faculty change, so we've been waiting to make sure we have enough of it to really expect it. But now that we've defined some group departments that have changed the most, we're in a position to ask, well, did they also see student change? My guess is yes, because I think these practices percolate into graduate admission and how we, they treat students, all those things. If one thing's changing, it starts to influence the other practices too. Which, by the way, means it can go the other way. You fix 
practices about students, it could go the other way, just might not. Anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying, we don't know yet, but we're working on it. Other questions? Yeah. What kind of pushback did you get? I mean, you've done remarkable work and incredible initiatives, but I'm sure there was a group of naysayers who thought this was a waste of time. Yes. How did that take place and how did you balance that out? It's much easier to answer that question now than it was 10 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, there were uh, there was a little group of three men in a science department, not to be named, who established a petition not only to stop our program on, at the university, they were at Michigan, not only at Michigan, but at NSF, because it was such a waste of NSF resources, national resources, our resources. They went to every department meeting of every STEM di discipline at Michigan, and then they circulated it at national meetings in their discipline. Not a single person signed it. Now, there were probably a lot of bad reasons people didn't sign it, <laughs> as well as some good ones. Um, but they created a very difficult situation for me and for our campus, because everybody was aware of all this activity and didn't yet know that nobody was going to sign it. Um, so what did we do? I met with these three guys a lot.